But most importantly, just thankful for God's word and that we get the, uh, just another opportunity and, and a privilege to turn to it yet again. What a blessing. And um, before we, we dive into the word this evening, uh, we're gonna, before we go to the word of the Lord, we're going to go to the Lord of the word. We're going to pray. So pray with me, if you will. Our Lord, Heavenly Father, God, we, again, just draw near to you on this Sabbath, God, the day that you've made. Lord, that we should rejoice in it and be glad in it, God. And we ask that on this Sabbath that you'd help us to rejoice in your work, God, your finished work. That we would also rest in it, Lord. That we would revel in it, God. Help us to uh, just reflect on it, Lord. As we turn to your word and we, we peer into your truth, help it to illuminate, God, just more of who you are, more of who we are as in light of that truth, and help us to respond, God, in such a way that would bring you honor, glory, and praise. Uh, Father, uh, the Spirit is willing this evening, but the flesh is a little weak, so empower us, Lord. Strengthen us. Um, hone us in. Sharpen our minds, God. Um, allow, allow your word to, to penetrate the depths of our soul this evening, God. Allow your light to just illuminate every crack and crevice of our being, and help us to respond in worship and adoration as you rightfully deserve all honor, glory, and praise. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 In, uh, back in 1979, I don't know if you're aware of this story or not, there was a passenger jet carrying roughly 250 people um, in New Zealand. And they were going on a flight seeing expedition to Antarctica and back. Unknown to the pilots, however, there was just a minor error in the flight coordinates of two degrees. This shifted the aircraft nearly 30 miles to the east of its intended destination of where the, uh, the pilots had originally intended to go. And as a result, as they approached Antarctica, the pilots descended to a lower altitude. Again, it's a sightseeing expedition. They wanted to give the, the passengers a better look out the window. Uh, and these, these pilots were seasoned veterans. They had they had flown for many years, but they have never made this particular flight before. And unfortunately, they had no way of knowing that the incorrect coordinates to the plane pl placed them directly in the path of Mount Arepus, an active volcano that rises more than 12,000 feet above the frozen tundra. Tragically, as a result of that small error, that minuscule error of just two degrees, the plane crashed into the side of the volcano and it killed every person on board. It was a tragedy brought on by just a minor error. Again, it was just a, mi a matter of two degrees in the coordinates. And, and this exposed what experts in aviation refer to as a one in 60 rule. It states that for every one degree a plane veers off its course, it will miss its intended destination by one mile for every 60 miles that it flies. And, and this can be um, compounded over time, right? This means that the further you travel over time, the further off your intended destination you will drift over time. You know, over time, a very small error can have extremely large consequences, can have devastating consequences, especially if it's left unchecked. You know, for example, just to carry this out, if we're off by just one degree, after 100 yards, we would be off by five feet. But after a mile, we would be off by 100 feet. If you were flying around the equator one time, you would end up off course by over 500 miles. I want to remember this 1 in 60 correlation because we're going to return back to it at the end of the sermon and tie it into today's message. So remember this, over time, how these small errors, if left unchecked, can have devastating consequences. You know, the point here that we're trying to make this evening is that small actions accumulated over a very long period of time can make huge differences. As in the story that we just heard, it can actually be a matter of life and death. And as we're soon going to see today, student ministry, which I'm going to refer to as discipleship, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it, it's, it correlates as well. It, it's, I like to refer to student discipleship as raising up arrows. 
Pastor Harris asked me to uh, share my vision, so to speak, for student ministry with you all tonight. And I want to refer to uh, the student discipleships this evening as raising up arrows. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, we're talking about children here, not airplanes. So where's the correlation? But as we're soon going to see as we turn to Psalm 127, the Bible refers to children as arrows. And both were made to fly. They were both crafted with that intended purpose. So please turn there with me, if you will, to Psalm 127. And if you're able, would you please stand out of reverence for the reading of God's word? Again, we're in Psalm 127. Behold the word of the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gates. Amen. The word of the Lord you may be seated. Thank you. I don't know if you're anything like me, but when most people think of arrows, they probably envision something that they would find at Dick's Sporting Goods Academy or maybe Bass Pro Shop. A well-engineered Manufactured, machine polished, ready to go, assembled broadhead with a fiberglass arrow, a fiberglass shaft, and a razor sharp broadhead on its end. But the arrow that the, the arrows that the Bible is referring to in this time period look very different. You know, the shaft was actually made from wood or a stiff reed, and the tail was fashioned from the feathers of a hawk or an eagle. The head was made from sharpened flint or rock or maybe even a piece of bone. Molding those arrows was a very tedious process. It was a process that required careful time and careful attention and, and, and supreme craftsmanship. If mistakes were made during the manufacturing process, these arrows would go off course and they could hold potentially devastating consequences. Having proper arrows oftentimes literally meant the difference between life and death. You see, arrows back then had two main purposes. They were used on the hunt to provide food or they would use on the, on the battlefield to protect. They were seen out on the battlefield during times of war or out on the game lands as they were implemented in the hunt. And missing an intended target would mean life or death in both of those instances. It would mean life or death on the battlefield. And it would also mean feast or famine in the home. And as a result, great care was taken into account of crafting these arrows. And hunters and warriors, they went through, they went through great lengths to straighten their arrows, to sharpen their arrows, to strengthen their arrows on a daily basis. Hunters and warriors desired arrows of the highest quality. Therefore, they sought out the very best. And I believe that we would do wise to learn from their standards of care and do the same with the arrows of our own. The Bible says that children are like arrows. And we too have to um, implement a, a training process with our children. They have to be straightened out. They have to be strengthened. They have to be sharpened. We don't want them to fail under pressure. We don't want them to veer off course shortly after taking off in flight towards life. But how can we do this successfully? And what sort of tools should be implemented throughout this process? You know, a truth that has often been overlooked is that this process has to take place prior to flight. It's supposed to happen while they're still in the home while they're still in the, the quiver, so to speak. Because once an arrow has been launched out into the world, it is nearly impossible to snatch it out of the air and shift its course once it's been fired. You know, this, this week 
It marked a new beginning here at Trinity Baptist Church in our our own arrow preparation process. This is my first official week as a new associate pastor with a focus on student ministry. And the the Lord has called my family and I here to come alongside of parents and grandparents of these precious students so that we can help disciple them and prepare them for what they were always intended to do. They were made by their creator to soar. They were made to go out into the world and protect and provide for their families. But more importantly, and what's oftentimes forgotten, they were made to go out and help advance the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. They were made to go out to, into the nations to, so that others can know Christ and that they can make him known. And this is a challenge that is, is it's not going to be easy for us today. Preparing students for life isn't easy. In fact, if we were to take an honest look at some of the arrows around us in our nation, we're going to see some, we're going to be soberly reminded of the fact that a lot of them aren't ready for this flight. In fact, a lot of them are already aimed in a very dangerous direction. In a recent survey by the CDC, it found that over 50% of children ages 18 to 29, if you still want to call them that, are still living at home with either one or both of their parents. Another CDC survey said that looks at mental health found that 75% of respondents age 18 to 24 reported at least one symptom of of anxiety or depression. And 25% of the respondents in that same age group, 25, a quarter of them, seriously contemplated suicide within the last week alone. You know, in the past two years, the teen suicide rate has shot up 24%, with a 60% increase from, 20, from 2007 to 2021 alone. And this is a trend that is only fearfully expected to get worse over time. Church, something has gone horribly wrong. Something has gone horribly wrong with our society. And I personally believe that it's, it's, there's no greater time for the church to rise up and do something about it. And maybe you're asking yourself in this moment, why is this a church issue? We're talking about the CDC here. That's a secular organization. Well, let's take a look at one more statistic. And this one hits a lot closer to home. In a recent article from LifeWay Research, it found that two-thirds, that's 66% of American young adults who once attended a Protestant church regularly as a teenager, today no longer do so. Brothers and sisters, the church has been missing the mark when it comes to biblical discipleship with students And it it desperately needs to correct its course because this is a problem. If left unchecked, will only get worse over time. You may may think to yourself, well, we've identified the problem, right, within our culture, but what can be done about it? I want to submit to you today from God's holy word that the scriptures have already given to us the solution. In fact, that's the main idea I have for us tonight. Coming from Psalm 127. God gifted the church with the blueprints necessary to craft arrows in his word. And it's for that reason that I refer to this message tonight as biblical blueprints. You know, the church can prepare their arrows for flight so long as we heed our Holy Father's instructions found in his word. The first truth I want to share with you all is this. God gifts us. He gifts the church with the warnings of futility. Look in verses 1 and 2. God warns the church of the warnings of futility. This is what happens when we build apart from his blueprints. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 again for our memory. It says that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it will labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early or go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for God gives to his beloved sleep. Church, Psalm 127, it starts out with a warning. It starts out 
warning us of the pain that comes from futility, of doing things apart from Christ. What pain am I talking about here? Well, just ask yourself, what happens to a house that's built in vain? It collapses. What happens to a city that is protected in vain? It's destroyed. This is a passage that provides us with two examples of what happens when we try to labor apart from the Lord. In both of those instances, destruction and great loss follows. The word of the Lord is calling out for us tonight. It's warning us of the potential for, if we're not careful, a devastating loss. One might say, well, what does building a house or watching over a city even have to do with children? And my answer to them would be simply this, everything. In both of those cases, isn't it true that careful time and attention is needed? In fact, one would say that parenting is a mixture of both building up and watching over, is it not? But we have to be careful as to how we do this because it can all be done if we're not careful in vain. There's a right and a wrong way to do it. And the word of God tells us that with these arrows, if we, if we work with these arrows starting early in the morning and we exhaust ourselves with these arrows late at night, it can be all done in vain if it's under our own futile efforts. What might that look like? Well, I believe that we can implement program after program after program. We can take these students to event after event after event. And in light of eternity, it will not make a single bit of difference. We don't want to look back on our ministry here and count it all as loss. Programs and events like t-ball, swim team, soccer, drama, dance, they've taken the place of discipleship. They've taken the place of worship. They've taken the place of the assembling of the saints. In our society today, spending time together under God's word outside of the church is practically unheard of. There are many families around the world today and perhaps even families within this own church that are falling short of what God commands us in Deuteronomy chapter 6. God commanded us, parents, to teach these things to their children diligently when they rise up And when they go to sleep, when they're on the way, over and over and over again. Trust me, I know, because at times, I struggle to be one of them. At times, I'm guilty of investing more in other people's children than I do with my own. And if someone were to ask us why, why do we fall short? Why do we do that? We would respond, well, there's just not enough time. But if we think about that statement for a moment... Are we seriously going to make that claim? Are we going to claim that we cannot make time for the one who literally made time? As if he's not important enough to make our list of priorities? Church, I hope you can hear my heart in this. Programs and events can be good things. They can be good things. I hope my own boys get involved in extracurricular activities. But when good things turn into ultimate things, they can become God things. And the Bible refers to these as idols. And idols lead to spiritual death and bondage. Church, our families don't have to eat the bread of anxious toil. God has provided rest for his beloved. He has done so by providing for us everything that we need that's necessary. He has given to us our daily bread. He has given to us his body, the bread of life that was broken for us. He has given to us the word of God, which is to be the nourishment for our souls. If there's a family out there that's starving for something more, if it's running around anxious and ragged, we have the answer. It's Christ. How how does our own households look if we were to take a look in the mirror, if we were to reflect on that moment? Do you make time? Do you stop and take time to have to partake in that restful meal, to receive the nourishment that your soul desperately needs? I want to call out to the parents in the room, to the grandparents in the room, brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to center everything we do around Jesus Christ. 
Just as the sun is the center of our solar system and and it gives life and light to the world as it revolves around it, we also must center everything we do around the Son of God. If we don't, we're going to drift off into vain pursuits that only lead to death and darkness. Can you imagine if the world for a moment said, I'm not going to no longer revolve around you. I'm going to figure this thing out on my own. As it drifts off into space, it just gets cold and dark and death soon follows. So how can we include God in the process of building up our children? I believe the first step in this process is to have a humble disposition. It's a position of humble disposition. We have to recognize our dire need for Jesus. And as a result, we have to search for the face of God daily in our lives. As it says in James 4, 8, draw near to God and then what? says he will draw near to you. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There are too many people in America today who are building up their hopes and their dreams and their lives and their aspirations apart from these biblical blueprints. And they wonder why at the end of time, why does it all crumble? The truth is it never had a chance. How can we just forget the architect? How can we just ditch the blueprints? How can we just roll up our sleeves and get to, get to work building our own kingdoms on the shifting sands of the world? It's like a sandcastle on the edge of a low tide. It never has a chance. Have we already forgotten that well-known Bible story? of the wise man who built his house upon the rock and the fool who built his house upon the sand. What happened, church, when those storms of life came and beat upon both of those houses in Matthew 7? Christ says that anyone who hears these words of mine and does them, he will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. When the rains of life fall and the floods come and the winds blow and they beat upon that house, it will not fall. Why? Because it has been founded on the rock. And anyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, he will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sands. When the rains fall and the floods come and the winds blow and they beat upon that house, it will fall. And great will be the fall of it. If this has been you for so long, repent. Hear the word of the Lord and be a doer of it. This is why marriages fail. This is why nations crumble. This is why futures are futile apart from the work of Christ in our life. Unless we hear his word and heed his word today. You know, I believe that there's too many parents out there who are foolishly more concerned with their students' GPAs than whether or not they understand the gospel. The Bible says that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. The Bible says that only a fool would say in his heart that there is no God. Now, perhaps somebody out there might say, well, hold on now, that's a little offensive. I believe that there's a God, and my response to them would be this lovingly, yes, but do you live like it? Can your children or your grandchildren tell by your actions that God is a priority in your life? Titus 1.16 warns us. It says that many people, many people will profess to know God, but they will deny him by their works. Too many parents are more concerned with their children's performance in athletic events than whether or not their children are running the race with endurance. When will we remember that when we get to heaven, batting averages won't matter? SAT scores won't matter. Our net worth won't matter. All that will matter is whether or not we know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and not just merely know of him. If there are parents or grandparents in the room, please hear me. I want to say this lovingly. It is not my primary responsibility to make sure that your children know Christ. 
The vast majority of that biblical accountability falls squarely on your shoulders. I'm just here to help you out. I saw it all too often. I I taught in public high school for seven years. Some of our children are so mixed up. They are so lost. It grieved my heart every day walking into that classroom. They don't even know their own genders anymore. They don't know their own sexual orientations anymore. And we sit back and we wonder why or how. How could things get this bad? Why are they so confused? I know why. I'll tell you why. It's because they don't know God anymore. They don't know the Bible anymore. They don't know who God is and who God has made them to be anymore. What's wrong with the world today? I'll tell you what it is. It's anyone who sits back willingly with complacency complacency, and they let the world tell our children what the word of God should. If we are going to be effective in student ministry here at this church, it must start by centering everything, modeling everything, our entire ministry from start to finish with the biblical blueprints of God's word. Yes, the Bible warns us that there is great pain that comes from the pointlessness of life apart from Christ, but there's hope for us today. We were made for something so much more. That's not the path we have to take. There's a better way. There is also a great peace and pleasure that flows from his precious promises. And we see that in in the remaining parts of this passage this evening. Look in verse 3, if you will, as we see that God gifts us. He gifts the church with a reward that comes from fruitfulness. Verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. You know, in today's culture that seeks to tell us otherwise, may the church boldly proclaim that children are a gift from God, a reward from our Redeemer. Yes, raising children is hard, right? Trust me, I know for the last several years, I've been a father, a youth pastor, a coach, a teacher. I've been around more young people than anyone else. It's tough at times. There are days when I get home from investing in children all day long, and I can tell you this honestly, the last thing I want to do is invest in my own. But there are also other days when I walk through that door and I hear their screams for daddy. I see the smiles on their face and they run to me with open arms. And this verse has never felt more real. Children are a blessing from the Lord and they are never meant to be seen as a burden. We have to address this lie in our culture. We have to address this lie in our society and we even have to address this lie in our churches. If we truly believe this, if we truly believe that children are a blessing from the Lord, if we truly believe that discipling them is of the utmost importance, then why is it that most churches have a hard time finding volunteers for children's ministry? Why are there countless children waiting in orphanages right now? Children were given to us from God as a reward. They were never meant to be handed back over to the world to be ruined. We have handed our children over to the world to be destroyed for far too long. And I'm talking about both before and after delivery. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we may be required to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but we must never hand over to Caesar's the things that rightfully belong to the Lord. It's time for the church to take back its children It's time for us to hand over to the Lord those who were made in his image. I pray that you would join us in this process of discipleship here. That you would join us in teaching them to know God, to learn who he is, to learn who God is, and who God has created them to be. A blessing to the world. Families in the room this evening, especially fathers, husbands, and grandfathers, Let me give you a challenge this week. Start spending time with the children that God has entrusted you with in God's word. It's time that we get our priorities back in line with God's promises. 
Start laboring with the Lord and allow the Lord to build your house and see if the Redeemer doesn't start to do just a little bit of remodeling in your own home. There is a promise that awaits us if we do this, and it's found in the third and final point that I'm going to share with you all tonight. It comes from verses 4 and 5 in the passage. God gifts us with a promise for the future. Look in verse 4 and 5 again, if you will. It says that like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. The word of God illuminates for us a promise. It tells of the potential that our children have if they're placed in the right person's hands. The Bible speaks of the future blessings that will be experienced so long as these arrows are prepared properly according to the blueprints found within his word. I would like for us to consider just one more thing this evening. Consider this for a moment. You know, most of us in the room tonight, most of you all, I believe, have probably raised your own arrows already. And now those arrows are raising arrows of their own. I want you to think back over this entire chapter for a moment. As we have just kindly of thoroughly unpacked this evening, tonight, that unless the Lord is involved in this process, every single thing we do is done in vain. No matter how pretty and polished and sharp and straight these arrows may look on the outside, they're only really as good as the one who's holding them. They're only as good as the warriors in whose hands they are being sharpened or held in. Why it doesn't do these arrows a a lick of good if the person who's holding that bow has no clue how to use it. It doesn't matter how prepared we've tried to make these arrows. If they're aimed in the wrong direction, they're not going to hit their intended target when released. Some of us in the room may have failed already to properly raise up our own children. Maybe they've already been sent out into the world and they're now lost as ever. Maybe your parents failed to raise you up properly. Perhaps you were neglected and aimed in the wrong direction. The bad news is that once an arrow has been released, once an arrow leaves your house, there truly is no way for us to stop it. It's out of our control. We can't stop them mid-flight. There's no way to change where they're heading under our own power. But the good news is there is someone else who can. No matter what sins or shortcomings or mistakes we have committed along the way in forming these arrows, aiming these arrows, or shooting these arrows, there is someone who planned ahead. He stood in the path of that destructive arrow. He stood in the path of that arrow and he stopped its sinful course with his own flesh. The scripture described it this way in the book of Isaiah. Jesus Christ was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we may be healed. Church, all we, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Amen. What a beautiful gospel. What precious promises that we have. That even if we were aimed in the wrong direction, there's someone who can stop us mid-flight and change our course. And that's Jesus Christ, the great carpenter. Do you remember in the beginning of my sermon when I asked you to remember the 61 rule in aviation? Hopefully you haven't forgot that by then, by now. I want to apply that just one last time to these arrows and share with you guys a fascinating fact. Did you know that the average person in their lifetime will take roughly 7,500 steps every day? If you've got a smartwatch, you can track it. If you maintain that daily average and you live on average 80 years, you will have walked over 215 million steps in your lifetime. 
If we do the math really quick, an average person living 80, walking a distance of of that many steps each day, will have walked roughly 110,000 miles in their lifetime. Now, assuming that they're only off by just one degree and using that 61 flight rule, this will lead to nearly 2,000 miles off course by the end of your life. To put things into perspective, that's the difference between landing in California or Carolina in a plane. But I want to submit to the church today that if we actually miss this message, it's actually going to be far more vast than that. The distance, the difference in distance is going to be what actually separates heaven and hell. Do you want to see students prepare to thrive as they soar through life? I would like to encourage you all by starting to get involved in some capacity, in some area of student ministry. If you're unsure of where to start, start by praying. Pray that the Lord will begin to work in the lives of students and their parents and in their grandparents. That they would raise them up according to God's blueprints, according to the master carpenter's plans, according to the blueprints found in his word. Pray that your prayers would lead to action. That over time, that as you pour your heart out to God, he would give you a burden to help serve in some capacity here in student ministry. You know, I I shared this with you last time I was here, not this morning, but when I was giving you my testimony weeks ago. My grandparents made the largest impact on my walk with the Lord. And if it wasn't for their influence, I truly do not know where I would be right now in my life. Who has God brought in your area of influence? Who could God use you to make an impact for the kingdom? He's given us everything we need to do it. He's given us the blueprints necessary. The only question that remains is, will we follow them? I pray we would. Church, let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for your word. It is good. We thank you, Lord, that even if we are not, even if we miss the mark, we all sin and fall short of your glory. God, you have laid upon Christ the iniquity of us all. We've all gone astray, each one to to, to their own way. But Lord, you have atoned for that on the cross. Help us to to have confidence to to rise up and and to repent, to turn from our, our, to, to correct the course, Lord, back to you. And we're thankful for the good shepherd, Lord, who who leads the flock in that direction. We thank you for your word, God, which grabs our hearts and pulls us closer to Christ each day. Help us, Lord, to be aware of opportunities around us, whether they're our children or children um, of a loved one, of a friend or a family near us. Maybe it's our neighbors. We all have an area of influence, God. We all have a mission field. And our mission field is is quite literally those area between our two feet, the here and the now. So as we go out into the world this week, help us to live on mission. Help us to remember the great commission, God, to make disciples of all nations. But help us to know that it's only to be done in the strength that you provide. Because if we labor apart from that, we labor in vain. Father, we, we love you and we thank you for loving us. We ask all of this in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen.